Who of you has ever done profiling on in a browser? Yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> How many of you ever did memory profiling? Yeah, that's all hands, that's all hands. So. Yeah. So, um, hi, uh, why, the, the, why did we ask that question about uh, uh, profiling? Well, because I think that like memory usage, uh, it's a part of web application that is commonly overlooked. Like we are in a world in which we have uh, uh, desktops with 32, 64 gig, gigs of RAM and uh, like every framework, think, think React for example, trades memory usage for performance. So. Is this a good thing? Uh, should we keep doing this? Can't this cause any problem? Um, well, yeah, that's the question for today. Hi, I'm Julio Zauza. I'm a software engineer. And today I wanted to bring you some lessons that I learned uh, while optimizing uh, uh, a pretty big React application. In fact, I'm working uh, on uh, this web application called Flux. Uh, and it's a browser-based uh, electronics CAD tool, Figma, but for designing e electrical circuits and PCB. And, and it's multiplayer, so it enables quick and collaborative work on those circuits. And um, our entire application is built with uh, uh, a lot of lines of TypeScript, uh, React, um, 3JS, Directory Fiber, um, our original bet was to bet on React for the rendering part and uh, use React Tree Fiber to do all the work. And in fact, like, like with Flux, you can work with pretty big documents uh, with a lot of different shapes, a lot of different electrical parts connected together. And each one of those things that you see there, uh, it's a React component that is rendering uh, on, a, on a canvas on, in WebGL, which is a lot <laughs> like we figure out and we want our application to be snappy responsive and scalable so we worked a lot on performance and originally we thought that frozen time um, during the interaction fps uh, like the common metrics for performance were enough and that's what we needed to optimize for but soon we realized that actually was just part of the picture that like all of the optimization, sometimes uh, you do, uh, you trade performance for memory. Like think about all the memorization that you do in React. And that's a thing that in our case backfired. And uh, we used uh, a lot of memorization, caches, uh, um, and stuff like that to make our application better and faster. Originally it made things better. Like we saw the application loading faster. At a certain point, the uh, stuff started the, uh, um, getting quite complicated with uh, our application going over the gigabyte mark uh, when it comes to memory consumption. And why did we do this? Do this? Well, because we follow what is still considered a uh, best practice for uh, developing React application. There is this famous article that advocates for memoing all the things. That just don't worry, just memo them. And uh, we figured out that yes, no, Depends. Yeah, that, that, that's a lot of people say depends, but this time for real. And um, like sometimes you don't want to memorize everything and um, because it really affects your memory usage and not in the way that you would expect. But you might ask, well, why do we want to optimize memory usage? Like this laptop, this laptop has 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, do we really want to care about like if your application takes some RAM? Well, yeah, um, because there are a lot of ways that memory can impact the, your application negatively. Um, that is not necessarily due to that. The most important one are out of memory crashes. Every time that on Chrome you see uh, an error code five, oh snap, something went wrong. That's an out of memory. That's the Chrome that saw that your application was using too much RAM and just kill the process and you can't catch that. Uh, that just happens and you have no way to, to fix that. You have no way to inform the user and recover it. And that the, like, there is no consensus around the web about what's the limit for Chrome, but it seems to be four gigabytes. There are some sources that say it's two and like a lot of people have asked, can you just remove that limit? 
and there is an issue that has been open in Chrome for years and then nobody ever done actually anything. So yeah, we have a memory limit. If you go over it, your application will, will crash. So yeah, you care about memory usage. And another thing is that suppose that you're just uh, optimizing for performance. Um, probably you sometimes saw in performance profiling something like this appearing, like uh, uh, a lot of uh, um, GC garbage, col garbage collector tasks, such as minor and major TC. That's you that uh, you have uh, um, allocated too much stuff and the browser has to say, no, stop, we need to pause your execution and clean up all the stuff that you allocated. So that also affects the, simply the, the performance of your application. And also you have to remember that your user is, doesn't, is not running only your application on, uh, on their device. They're probably running a lot of other stuff in parallel. Uh, you've probably seen a lot of people with a lot of tabs open. And if each one of the, that tab takes 300, 700 megabytes, then that like memory starts to get a bit occupied at a certain point. And this is true, especially now that uh, if you open a tab in Chrome and you hover over the title, you can see the memory usage. So the users will be able to see if, you're not, if your application is it's the one that is uh, uh, blocking their computer. So you probably want to optimize it for this reason as well. So yeah, we care about uh, memory usage. And uh, suppose that you have an application that is taking up a lot of RAM. How do we solve this? How, what are the steps that we can take to uh, make the situation better? Well, um, the approach that we use is that first of all, we need to occupy, uh, sorry, identify what is occupying too much memory. And that's already typical on its own. After you identified what is taking up memory, uh, you need to find a way to simplify that or reduce the usage, maybe by using some optimized other structure. And very important, you have to make sure that you're not repeating the same uh, mistake again. And there are a lot of very cool ways to do that, even uh, integrated with your CI pipeline. And of course, for this talk, since uh, like this is already a very big topic, I want to focus on the on the first one because like the point two and three, like it's they are very dependent on what you're doing, uh, and uh, I could talk for hours, but uh, uh, I just want to give you like a bit of an overview. And um, yeah, so um, before um, actually discussing about it, I think it makes sense to introduce some terminology. Like, uh, what are we talking about? Let's introduce some concepts. Um, the first one that I wanted to introduce is the difference between static and transient memory usage. Um, the, the difference between those two is that you need to analyze them differently. In fact, the static memory usage, it's the uh, memory that is used in your application at a steady state when no one is touching it. Like imagine all the global variables, all the variables that are there for rendering, uh, everything that you would find uh, by just taking a hip snapshot of uh, your application when nobody's using it. And uh, then there is also the transient memory usage, which differs because uh, uh, transient memory usage is it's when you have peaks of memory usage. Imagine that, for example, when you press a button in your application, you fire an event handler that uh, starts allocating a very big array with a lot, of, a lot of objects, and then immediately deallocates it. You, you cannot really see that on a memory profile, on, um, on a hip snapshot, because uh, a hip snapshot uh, is just an instant in time. Then there is another important distinction that is the, uh, the distinction between count and size. Because in, um, sometimes you can be in a very lucky situation in which you have just two very big arrays to type the array buffer or something, uh, which are very big, so they very stand out in a memory profile. But you can also be in a bit of a more sad situation in which you have uh, a lot and like millions of tiny objects of four bytes each that can easily become hundreds of megabytes if uh, you're not keeping them in check. And when you are in that situation, profiling gets a lot harder. There is also another distinction that is the one between shallow and retained size. And those are two uh, concepts that you will see in a hip snapshot. And it is that uh, uh, like everything in JavaScript is a pointer, like everything is a reference. 
So you can have uh, uh, objects that are referring to other objects. You can have uh, some uh, uh, things that uh, sh like can take a lot of memory, like for example a string that can take up one megabyte. But you can also have uh, uh, an array that uh, on its own is just 40 bytes, it's not much. But uh, if you count everything that that array is uh, pointing towards, then that array is occupying 10 megabytes because uh, it's, it has a lot of pointers to uh, things that are much bigger. So that's what we're talking when we're talking about shallow and retained size. Shallow, it's the thing on its own, how much memory it's taking. And retained is uh, how much memory you would free up if that thing did not exist, because that thing was referring to other things. Uh, then lastly, there is a, uh, another thing that I think it's important to introduce, and it's the allocation types, because uh, uh, that's a bit browser dependent, but every browser treats every kind of data a bit differently. You can have strings, JS array, typed arrays, and it's also, I think, uh, interesting to see how code, JavaScript code, uh, on its own <laughs> takes up memory, like uh, uh, when Chrome performs the just-in-time compilation, or it has to parse all ja the JavaScript code text, that takes up memory as well. And also, uh, you can discover some interesting things, such as functions are taking up memory. Why? Because they're closures, because they need to keep track of the environment where they were created. So like if you start creating functions in a for loop, then that, that can really be heavy on your memory usage. So that's another thing that uh, you can discover with uh, memory profile. So we were talking about memory profiles. Uh, let's discuss tooling. What, is the, what are the tools that uh, are available to analyze memory usage? Well, first of all, of course, the Chrome memory profiler. As you can have the time profiler, this is also the memory tab that uh, it's a bit less known. But I think it's really, really cool and very powerful. Uh, you have basically three options, the heap snapshot, allocation instrumentation timeline, and the allocation sampling. I think that the first and the third, heap snapshot and uh, allocation sampling are the most interesting ones. And, uh, but they are interesting for two different reasons. The um, first one, heap snapshot, um, it's a tool that allows you to take uh, a complete copy, an image, of what's in your memory at a given point in time. It's like if you're taking a, uh, a picture with a camera of your RAM, um, that is very useful to analyze static memory usage. What is in, in your RAM right now? So it's not really useful for, uh, um, for analyzing uh, uh, transient memory usage. If you want to instead look at transient peaks of memory usage, there is allocation sampling, which is fundamentally different because instead of uh, analyzing what's in your RAM, it's looking at what's being allocated. So this means that everything that you see here could have been deallocated. You're just seeing stuff that gets added, not when stuff gets removed. But this is really powerful because it breaks down by each path in your code, by each function, what are the ones that are taking up a lot of RAM. So with this, you can, for example, see that, oh, I have that specific event handler in my React code that uh, when I press that button, it starts allocating 200 megabytes. So with this, I know that uh, I have to optimize it first. So those are two very cool and interesting tools, but for two different purposes. So uh, let's play with it a bit. Like uh, um, just by using those two tools, you can make some very powerful memory optimization. <laughs> and I can show you, for example, how I optimize the app that, I've, that I'm working on. Can I do this? Maybe. No, I can. I'm just gonna show a video. Yeah, the idea is that uh, uh, we can. Is it playing? We can take a heap snapshot. Here I already uh, recorded it because it's a bit too difficult to shoot to change the screen. And uh, when we perform a heap snapshot, then we can click on it. Hopefully. Okay, and we're able to see a list of uh, every object type, every type of things in our application and what are, what are they doing there. And uh, in this case, for example, we can see that we have objects, fiber nodes, arrays, and we see that we have uh, 
a lot of maps. We have like 10,000s of them. And we have uh, specifically one map object that is taking up 84 megabytes of RAM, which is a lot. And it's considerably more than uh, uh, what the other map objects are taking up. And uh, it's very cool because you're also able to see who is the thing that uh, it's retaining that object. What is the thing that uh, it's causing that object to stay in memory? And in our case, it was that uh, function there called the frame, fast use frame events. And some context here, like we are, it's an hook, an hook that we were using in our application to keep track of uh, uh, subscriptions on the frame loop. And the idea is that uh, uh, we were using this hook to subscribe uh, to a thing. And this, that hook was uh, creating an UID to keep track of the, of the hook. And then it had a use effect and it was doing a bunch of stuff. And uh, so this means that if we call these uh, thousands of times, we're creating thousands of UADs, which they can start to take up a lot of memory. And uh, with this, we figure out, yeah, we need, we need to optimize this. And so uh, I went there and I replaced that map with, uh, with a set, which is a bit more efficient as you don't need to uh, keep the UIDC in memory. You just need to uh, put the functions there and then you can iterate on it. And that was very impactful because like it gave us a 50% uh, memory improvement because we were able to completely remove that uh, 84 megabytes that were uh, being taken by the, uh, by the map. You can see that that's a bit more and that's also because uh, um, it was not only the UADs, it was actually the use state hook that when called thousands of times, it was taking up a lot of RAM. And that's something that we discovered later. And, but we had to go a bit deeper to discover that. Why a bit deeper? Because if you look at that profile, you can see that uh, you have uh, hundreds of megabytes being occupied by objects and you try to figure out what are those objects? Why are objects taking up so much memory? And you see two millions of them and you wonder what's inside that? Is there like, what, what, what are those objects? And it turns out that uh, the Chrome memory profiler is very bad at answering this question because it can't group stuff together. And uh, so we're like, okay, how do we do this? Thankfully, um, you can quickly figure out that you can do right click save on memory profiles. You can export a big uh, gigabyte li large uh, JSON. And uh, so you can uh, put it in a script or something and analyze what is going on there. K kinda, because uh, the format, uh, it's not too well documented. Uh, it's pretty difficult to parse. But thankfully, um, meta engineering is helping us at, uh, at that. There is this amazing tool done by Facebook Meta called uh, MemLab, uh, which is like a complete uh, set of tools for uh, uh, memory profiling. It can do a lot of things like uh, automated detection of, uh, um, uh, of uh, um, memory leaks. And it can also work uh, as an API for analyzing snapshot. It has like a, a bunch of things that you can uh, import snapshots and perform analysis on them. So, uh, like you can create a class, which is a new analyzer, a plugin for MemLab, with which you can uh, uh, perform those analyses. And for example, one of the analyses was uh, a question that we had. Which types of objects are taking up the most space out of that two millions that we had before? So yeah, we wrote a, uh, I wrote some code. I don't want to go through the code, but I will publish it on GitHub. The idea is that you can load the snapshot, find all the object types, what are all the possible types of objects that you have in your snapshot, compute the total shallow size for each one, and then sort and print the result. And the results were really interesting because uh, uh, this, this way we were able to figure out what were the kind of objects that were taking up the most memory. And we looked at the first one, we we're like, what's that? That's not ours. That, that, like, that was not a part of our application. And in fact, base queue, base state, queue, next, memoir state, that's part of React. That's uh, uh, an internal data structure used by React that apparently was taking up 52 megabytes, which is a lot. 
And uh, the idea is that that's how React hooks work. Like uh, React, uh, um, that's a quick primer on how uh, React rendering works. Uh, it uses this data structure called uh, a fiber node. Uh, that is a data structure that is used to keep track of uh, your React rendering. So basically React creates one of those data structure for uh, its component that you're rendering. And it contains stuff like your key, uh, your children, uh, your output, uh, uh, the a pointer to the function uh, for rendering, and a very important uh, property called memoize state. The idea is that memoize state is what is keeping track of hooks. It's a linked list that for each hook call appends at the end of the linked list a node that contains what is the current value of that hook. <laughs> so you can imagine that you call use memo and there it gets persisted your result and uh, your dependency, use callback, your function goes there and so on. As, and since, since it's a linked list, that's the reason why you can't call hook conditionally because it, it's relying uh, on stuff being called uh, on the same order so that it can walk the linked list and get back fetch and return the current value uh, for that specific hook call. So it turns out that uh, if uh, each hook call is uh, making that linked list bigger, keeping track of hooks is expensive. Like uh, hooks, like uh, use memo, use state, uh, uh, use callback, and all those performance optimization are expensive, but not because the value inside of them is taking, up, is taking up a lot of RAM, but because keeping track of them is expensive, like the data structure that we need to, uh, that we need to keep in RAM. So from this, we got a strategy. We had to take all the hooks that we had around, simplify, merge them, and uh, remove everything that was not needed. But we had another question there. Which one do we need to optimize first? What are the React components that are the, uh, the most heavy? So we wrote another plugin for MemLab, this time much more focused on React, which uh, finds all the React components through the fiber nodes in the heap snapshot, determining which React component it belongs to, so you can give a name to it, and it computes statistics about each fiber node so that we can figure out for each React component how much RAM that React component is taking. And go directly to the results which were pretty interesting, like we had this very long list of uh, all the React components and uh, what were the hooks inside of them, how much RAM were they taking up and uh, with this we were like, yeah, that's the one we need that we need to optimize first and uh, <laughs> ultimately the way, the way that we optimized that specific React component was to take it out, taking it outside of React, so instead of having a uh, 4,000 React components for it. We had a single one that rendered all the instances. So yeah, sometimes the best way to optimize React is removing React. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> yeah, depends a lot on what you're doing. I doubt that uh, um, normal uh, application will uh, arrive at this point, but if you're doing something very complicated, yeah, you can arrive there. And with that, we were able to understand even more about our application, like uh, we had another question. We have a lot of UADs. All UADs are string. We know that we can uh, represent UADs as numbers, but how much is that going to say? Like, how many UADs do we have around the code? And uh, if we removed all of them, how much RAM would, um, have, would, can we say? And we figured out it was like three megabytes. So we're like, no, don't bother. And uh, that's very important because otherwise a lot of people will be like, uh, yeah, that's definitely the problem, which is you can gather, gather data. You, uh, you can work on performance on a data-driven way without having to guess and maybe work for a month and then figure out that you did a lot of stuff for nothing. So yeah, um, just to summarize um, what I said in my talk, uh, uh, memory analysis is cool, but difficult, especially given the um, how much is it dependent on browsing internals uh, and because like there is not much uh, information around it online and uh, some optimization sometimes the optimization you think can make the thing better can backfire so you need to be really careful and really data driven and that the chrome profiler is cool 
but sometimes you go you have to go a bit further and use cooler tools such as memlab and uh, the most important thing is that react hooks are expensive so be careful around them and yeah that's it thank you for